All right, sorry about that brief uh, interruption in our live stream. I wanted to make sure that we had that donate button going because right now those donations that you are giving us through your, the kindness of your heart are doing wonders to help us see us through the, the period when we're closed to visitors and to help us continue doing the conservation work that Meredith Harris, who, if you're just joining us, our reintroduction biologist, is still doing even though we don't have any guests in our building. So uh, that donate button is live now. And Meredith, you are going to show us how you spawn Ap Southern Appalachian brook trout. So let's go ahead and kick off that simulation. Okay, so we don't have any adults, so this is gonna be our fish. This is what an adult brook trout looks like. They're very distinctive from rainbow trout and brown trout because they have very vibrant red fins that have a white margin on the front edge of them. And uh, they also have a lot of kind of speckles down their body, which is how they get their nickname, the specks or speckled trout. So this is going to be our, our female fish, right? So that's the one that we start with. And when we have the white fish, we actually anesthetize them. So we kind of, um, not really put them to sleep per se, but just kind of relax them so that the whole process is very easy and smooth for them. Um, and we're, first off, we're going to weigh them. So we have a scale here that we would put them in. We would also get a length on them, and that data can be very helpful for us down the road to learn more about the species of the fish. Um, and after we weigh and measure them, then we have to completely dry off the fish because kind of uh, counterintuitively, if any water gets into this process before we're ready, it can ruin the whole thing. So for something that spawns in the water, it kind of seems kind of seems odd, but, um, but that's how we have to do it. So once we've dried off the female, then we can just kind of massage her belly and if her eggs are what we call ripe, meaning that they're mature and they're ready to be laid, then she would release them into a bowl, just a regular kitchen mixing bowl that we would have ready. Um, I have a simulated egg right here. <laughs> so uh, that's about the same size and questionable shape and texture of brook trout eggs. Brook trout eggs are actually yellow in color though. So they would be more of this color. But since we don't have actual trout eggs, I'm using tapioca balls instead uh, as a substitute. So once the female has given eggs, then we would take our male fish and we would do the same process where we would weigh and measure them as well, dry them off again, and then with the same massaging motion, we can get them to release milk with this fish sperm. And there's not very much of it, but we would put that right on the eggs. And then we would add a saline solution, which is just fancy science called for salt water, to the eggs, just enough to cover the eggs. And that's when the promised turkey feather comes into play. And we use that to stir the eggs together. And this is when the actual fertilization, what we call the water activation period, occurs. Sure, somebody's going to ask the question. So go ahead and head it off. Why in the world do we use a turkey feather for this part? Um, and that's just because the turkey feather bristles are very gentle on the edge. So if we use something like a spoon, that could damage the very, very delicate edge. But this is very soft, and we just kind of slowly and gently mix the milk, the water, and the eggs together. Lou Everman says, this is the wildest cooking show ever today. I mean, it's not Rachel Ray with penguins, but I think it's a close second. Yeah, Lou, you are not wrong. And this is, this is literally note for note uh, what I saw uh, Meredith do last October when we spawned the fish that you saw in those runs earlier. <laughs> okay, so after we do the fertilization and the water activation, we want to sanitize the eggs. This is iodine which is just a disinfecting agent that is harmless to the eggs. So we're just going to pour some of that onto the eggs. It kind of turns that nice iodine color. And then we let those sit for about 15 minutes. We've got some donations coming in. Thank you so much for, for donating. Uh, I, we really can't tell you how important uh, every little bit of support we're getting these days is. So. So those of you who donated, thank you so, so much. We really, really appreciate it. So after we would disinfect the eggs, we pour off that iodine very carefully 
so we don't lose any of the eggs, but if we lose these tapioca pearls, it probably won't be the end of the world. And then we wash them. And we should also say that it's safe for us to pour that kind of thing down the drain. We're pretty conscious about the impact that anything that we put down in the drains would have on the environment. And that is definitely something that is safe. Oh, yes. So we really take that into account because, you know, our, our overall mission is to do the best practices and do whatever we can to protect our water chain. That's true. So what, uh, speaking of, that's a nice segue. Uh, one of the things that we've started doing as part of our aquarium at home endeavor is uh, weekday wonders, which is a series of curated educational activities uh, that you can do with your kids or have your kids do by themselves uh, during this period where a lot of us are confined to our homes, a uh, way to get them out of the house, thinking about uh, the things that are around them in maybe a different way, get their minds stimulated. And today's question of the day is how do you protect your watershed? So Meredith has already uh, given us one good uh, way to do that, which is to make sure you watch what you put down the drains. But uh, Meredith, do you think of any other ways that you can uh, watch after and, sh and take care of your watershed? Another really good one is fertilizer. So that's something you maybe don't think about, but if you follow the instructions on fertilizer, when you put that on your lawn, uh, you use the right amount, then you minimize the amount that does run off into the, into the watershed. So that's another good way. But we do have a couple questions that have come in, Meredith, one of which is, how old are the fish that are in the runs uh, that we saw earlier? And we can go ahead and walk back over since somebody might be joining and missed the first part of this where we actually saw the baby fish. But how old are they and uh, where will they be released? These fish are about five months old. They hatch out of their eggs in December. And they uh, are eventually going to be released into the Watauga River Shed in northeastern Tennessee. Um, they're going to be released high up in the, some of the mountains in the Cherokee National Forest, so it's, it's protected. And it's the high elevation where there are small headwater creatures. Now, how do we determine where we're going to do releases? So that is a collaboration with the Sessie Wallace Resource Agency, the CWRA. They do a lot of the groundwork where they scout out the places that uh, are good candidates for restoration. And there's a number of things that go into that, such as Outcompete our native brook trout. Um, if they can get rid of any non native fish that are present there, then is there a barrier downstream that will prevent them from moving back into the stream? Um, it's looking at the land around the creek and making sure that we're not going to have a lot of sediment or other pollutants wash into the creek and end up making the brook trout decline again. Um, yeah, so they really do a lot of that work and then we provide the fish. Okay, great. Uh, so we have another question from Emily Hardy who is asking this time on behalf of six-year-old Jolie, do those fish bite?
I'm going to go ahead and preface this by saying I apologize because I'm sure I'm going to mess your name up, but Hezekiah Ulrich Brown would like to know what kind of predators like to eat baby trout. Oh, wow. Okay, so um, predators would include herons and other birds like kingfishers that eat fish. Um, you would have things like snakes. The northern water snake actually eats fish that they catch in the in the creek. Um, and even some mammals like otters would probably love to chow down on a brook trout. All right. But not humans as far as southern Appalachian brook trout go because they are catch and release only and they, they are uh, they do have some protection. Just like the lake sturgeon that were the star of the last live stream that you did. Now, I interrupted your simulation, I apologize for that, so let's go back, because I think we're not quite done with spawning these eggs. Or fertilizing the eggs, I should say. part of the simulation, because after we uh, do the disinfection everything, we do let them sit in some holes, uh, system water, and then they will fertilize again. Okay. So they were just sitting in, and, you know, marinating for the appropriate amount of time. But once that is done, um, and they don't get stained blue like these tapioca pearls do. They stay that amber yellow color. But once we're through washing them and letting them sit, we're going to add them to an egg jar where they remain um, until they hatch. And that looks something like this. Egg jar. Um, and there is a... I feel like you need an assistant. I'm sorry. I very carefully because they are very delicate. We won't add all the tapioca, but we would add all of the eggs. And once they're down in there, then we would cover them up with this so they don't get washed out. And then we set them in these raceways which are in the And they will stay eggs for as long as four to six weeks, which is long compared to some of the other freshwater Is there a reason that they have such a long incubation time? Uh, it's probably something to do with the fact that they spawn in cold water in the fall. Um, fish are very nervous about being in the cold water because they don't want to get sick. Um, and so they spawn in cold water. So they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. Um, but they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. And they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. And they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. And they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. And they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. And they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. And they spawn in cold water because they don't want to get sick. Um, the eggs take a very long time to develop. Yes, that water is very, very, very cold. Uh, it's one of the hazards of Meredith's job that she has to have her, her hands and arms in it uh, pretty frequently. And this is a brook trout. But that is why you see the black insulation all over these pipes and the tanks themselves. Um, because we do have to keep it chilled right now. And the water is actually very cold. And trout have a very narrow thermal tolerance, meaning that they cannot stay very warm. All right, so Tammy McDonough would like to know how many eggs would hatch out of all of those in the bowl. Now, there were probably a few more tapioca pearls or whatever they were uh, than, than there would be actual eggs, but I mean, how many would hatch out of a, if you, out of a typical spawning session? trout would have is really variable. We've had anywhere between, you know, 90 to, you know, 350 eggs. Um, and the, how many eggs that fertilize is very variable too. It can be anywhere from zero to 98% um, that we've seen here in the hatchery. And then out of those fertilized eggs, you would probably see a high number survive to hatching, um, probably around 50 to 99%. Okay, uh, so we have a couple more questions. I'll try and give you some shots of the actual fish since uh, we haven't really shown that many. Uh, but Meredith, Sam Graff would like to know, what are the differences uh, between Southern Appalachian brook trout and the brook trout you would find elsewhere? That, that is a fantastic question. The Southern Appalachian brook trout are very special because they are the South's only native species. There are brook trout found genetically different from our fish here. Um, the Southern Appalachian brook trout have 
spent, you know, many, many, many millions of years evolving to be very specialized for conditions in the southeastern United States. And over time, and being isolated from the fish in the northern part of the U.S., they have become they have become their own, their distinct population. Um, yeah, you know, you can see a difference in a lot of the wild brook trout in the south versus the north. Our southern fish are smaller than the northern strain. Um, but a lot of people uh, love to fish for the southern Appalachian brook trout because catching a wild brookie is something that's very special to people that feel a connection with, with nature in the southeastern west. And in fact, a lot of the work that we do here is actually done in partnership and is helped uh, financially. We're financially supported by Trout Unlimited. Yes, absolutely. Our entire program with the Brook Trout is funded by a conservation grant program that Trout Unlimited uh, gives us almost every year. Um, and that is funded through the sale of those beautiful Brook Trout license plates that you have maybe seen driving down the road. Um, almost 100% of those fines go into, into work like this, and it's really important for conservation programs like this. All right, so it looks like we got some people who are tuning in a little bit late. So uh, I do apologize, Josie Hunter, that Lincoln and Malin, or Malin? I'm sorry, I think you've told me how to pronounce this before, but uh, I'm sorry that you don't know what kind of fish we're talking about, but we are talking about the Southern Appalachian Brook Trout. And if, they, and if you look at that fish, and that fish looks familiar to you, if you visited the aquarium, you can actually see them as you're exiting the, cove, the Appalachian Cove Forest. They are in a, one of our tanks before you enter what we call the canyon. So once you enter the actual building itself, and then once you get in the building, they're actually in that first mountain stream exhibit on the left as you're beginning to descend down the ramp. Very cool. Now, Cheryl Murray is asking how many survive, and I'm not sure if Cheryl asked this question when we were talking about the uh, the actual uh, fertilization process, the simulation you were doing, or if she's talking about out in the wild. But whichever of those you can answer, how many of these fish survive? Yeah, so um, surviving to hatch is pretty high after fertilization. We talked about you know 50 to 99 percent of the fish that actually fertilize. And then in the wild, that's, it's hard to say. Um, it takes a lot of, of field work and a lot of many years of, of programs like market and capture uh, projects to figure out an estimate of how many stock fish survive. So from what we can tell, it's probably pretty high. Um, we were restoring a stream in the same watershed that these ones were going to go to. And within three years, enough fish had survived to adulthood that we were documenting what we call natural recruitment. Meaning they were reproducing on their own in the wild and we didn't have to stop there anymore. So we felt pretty confident that enough survived to adulthood that they didn't need our help. And you mentioned earlier that working, doing these propagation programs is really hard work. You know, there's a lot of effort that goes into it over a very long period of time. And then you multiply every year class times how many years we've been doing the program. I mean, these are very, very long programs that you, you can't go into it with a short-term commitment. You really have to go in with the long view sort of in mind. Um, you have to take a lot of things into account, um, like the fish's genes. You need to stock a lot of, of different fish that have different parents to keep that variability high. Um, you have to stock different age classes. You can't just put all fish out of the exact same age and walk away either because that's not very natural. You know, you want to have all age classes representative in your population. So given the fact that these are such long projects, uh, long-term projects. What what does it feel like to have a moment like last year when we heard that that creek had reached the point where natural recruitment was taking place? Uh, that was excellent. That was great news. Um, you know, that's one of the big milestones that you have to wait and see before you can consider a program successful. Um, and you know, it's kind of, it's kind of funny being a reintroduction biologist because when your job is no longer necessary. Sort of the in game, right? <laughs> so I, I want these guys to not 
not need me to do this anymore, um, that would make me really, really happy. Now, Meredith, why did you, uh, first of all, I'll let you go ahead because I know you're going to try and catch one of these little guys out so we can get a little bit of a better view. But while you're doing that, can you tell us why you wanted to become a biologist and specifically why a reintroduction biologist? So we got some more questions coming in. Thank you so much for typing so many great questions. I mean, we're getting some really good questions that are obviously from, from some kids. We're getting some very, I think, very high level uh, academic questions as well. Uh, so thank you for all of those. But the next one I wanted to ask is by, on behalf of Luke Hardy. This is Emily Hardy again. This is four-year-old Luke who wants to know, is this water as cold as the pink water? You would not want to swim in this water or in the penguin water. <laughs> All right, so these are baby Southern Appalachian brook trout. See, they are pretty cute, huh? They are very cute. Uh, Jan Hayes asks, when is the next release and where, and will, it, and will it be a public event? Really, some anglers and hunters happen to be some of the best conservationists. It's true. Yeah, they're very passionate about keeping our wild southern Appalachian trout going because they do so enjoy being out in nature with them and catching them. And many of them say that this is, uh, and we say this actually frequently with a lot of the species that we talk about when people ask the question of, you know, why does a fish that's so small that I probably don't even see it in a stream matter? And, you know, there are a couple of different answers to that, one of which is that we don't know at what point a fish's existence is going to make, or disappearance from a habitat is going to make the whole ecosystem become unbalanced, but also it's part of our natural heritage. It is, yeah. I, I feel a very deep connection with the Southern Appalachian Brook Trout because this, this fish is really our small species, and we don't really think of it as a threat Cheryl Murray says, cute babies. You are correct, Cheryl. These are very cute babies. And at this age, you can see they're starting to get some of the patterning down their sides that is distinctive for the brook trout. Kind of those spots and speckles and kind of some shading that looks like vertical bars. And if you look really close, you can start to see the red pigment coming in on their tail fin and their pectoral fin. Very cool. Emily Hardy says, thank you all so much. Well, I will re return that and say thank you very much, Emily, for asking such great questions and for watching uh, these live streams. 
But and thank you again to all of you who have donated. We've had some donations come in, and again, those really make a huge difference. It might not seem like a mu like much to you, or maybe it does seem like a lot to you. But every little bit really does. It, it is very significant to us, and will very much help us to weather the financial storm while the buildings are closed to the public. It does help us buy more blood work. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, if there are no other questions, I guess I'll go ahead and end the live stream, but I would hate for anybody who had a question that they were just waiting to ask to not get a, que a chance to get that question answered. So I'll take just a couple more minutes. We'll look at some more of these little beautiful baby brook trout, and I'll give you a chance to ask your questions. And if I don't get any more, we'll go ahead and sign off. But again, thank you to those of you who have been so patient watching us enduring these technical difficulties as I forgot to put our donate button on, sticking with us through two different iterations of this live stream and learning more about these really beautiful native trout, the only native trout in all of Tennessee, the Southern Appalachian brook trout. Well, while we're waiting uh, for questions, I do have one more question for Meredith and actually she just whispered it in my ear uh, that I had neglected to, to ask on your behalf why the Southern Appalachian Brook Trout even needs our help. Why did they disappear to begin with? Lou Everman, uh, who has asked many good questions in the course of this uh, stream, would like to know, and I'm glad he asked because I'm actually curious about this myself, why do they all stay in formation like that and swim in place? And you can see on, on screen right now exactly what he's talking about. Yeah, um, so they all kind of gathered together because um, I think they feel kind of safety in numbers at this age. Um, despite having been hatched and raised in captivity their entire life, they have a really, really strong instinct to run away from any big, maybe ugly looking predator that's coming at them like myself. Um, so I'm gonna wave my hand over the top of them and you'll see that startled response pretty well, right? So 
that helps them survive in the wild because in the wild that could be something like a heron coming to snatch them up. Um, the reason that they're all facing the same direction is because we have water flowing into this long skinny raceway up here and they always like to position themselves so they're facing the current. And the reason for that uh, tends to be as food gets washed downstream, they can face it head on and skip and snatch it out one off. Very cool. All right, it looks like we've, uh, wow, that was a very generous donation. Thank you very much. Uh, and I don't know if it, if it says who gave the donation, so I'm not gonna say it, but uh, you know who you are. Thank you very much for that donation. Uh, and a, an account named Snowflake Sturgeon asked us, do non-native uh, fish, are non-native fish a problem for the brook trout? And you just answered it, so uh, that account says, that answers my question. <laughs> so preemptively. All right, well, it looks like we've, we've kind of run, uh, run out of things to show you, uh, but these have been really, really excellent questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for today's Aquarium at Home live stream. Do make sure that you tune in uh, every day of the week, Monday through Friday. We do have these, uh, these live streams going up about one o'clock every day. We have a different subject every day. Sometimes we have different locations, like today where we're out at the Tennessee Aquarium Conservation Institute. So we do like to take you on little field trips, show you some behind the scenes whenever possible. And those will start up again on Monday. And in the meantime, uh, you can go to our website, tnaqua.org, where we have an Aquarium at Home subpage that has a lot of different resources like these live streams. We have a few of them archived on our YouTube channel, as well as things like activity sheets, uh, printable coloring pages, uh, the Weekday Wonders uh, curated educational content I talked about earlier is located in that location, as well as some other fun things you can do with your kids at home, some IMAX movies that you can check out, uh, some of them for free, and uh, educational packets that go along with those. So lots of things for you to do to keep you distracted during this time when a lot of us are trapped at home. But Meredith, thank you very much again for taking the time to show us what you do, the important work you're doing, and that we as an institution are doing to save native fish and for taking the time to answer all those questions. All right, we're tuning out. So we'll see you guys again on Monday. Thank you very much for joining us.